Hello, everyone. Welcome. I'm going to uh, talk uh, just for a second as the room populates. We have um, a couple hundred people in attendance uh, or registered for today's event. And so I just want to make sure everyone has an opportunity to enter the room. Uh, we have got a great lineup for you tonight. Okay, so um, welcome everybody. Uh, we're delighted to welcome you to Trans Literature Now, an event co-sponsored by the National Book Critics Circle's DEI Conversation Series. Established in 2021, this series offers a platform for learning from subject matter experts within the literary community providing opportunities to engage with our past, present, and future. We're also proud to have the support of Barnard's Center for Research on Women. Founded in 1971, the center brings together scholars and activists through working groups, public events, publications, and multimedia projects to promote intersectional social justice, feminist analyses, and drive social transformation. I'm Ruben Quesada, your tech host for the evening. And before I introduce our moderator, I'd like to go over a few housekeeping details. If you want to view our ASL interpreters throughout the webinar, please ensure you have the gallery view selected in the upper right-hand corner of your Zoom screen to view participants. And if you'd like to enable closed captioning, and view a live automated transcript, click the CC button at the bottom of your Zoom screen. You can also click view full transcript to view the transcript in the side panel of this meeting. Take a moment to locate the chat box in the bottom right and let us know where you are joining us from today. Feel free to join the conversation during tonight's event. We'll have time for questions and answers for our panelists. If you have a question, we ask you to use the ask a question box at the bottom of your screen at any time so we can bring it into the conversation during the Q&A. Ask as many questions as you'd like. I will monitor the ask a question box and our chat and I will post relevant links in the chat as our critics engage in discussion. As VP of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion at the National Book Critics Circle, I am pleased to have the opportunity to introduce today's moderator. This individual proposed the brilliant event we are all attending, and we've had the privilege of serving together on the board for the past year. Their welcoming spirit serves as a soothing balm within the literary arts, and I'm honored to introduce them to you today. Your moderator for Trans Literature Now, a conversation about living, writing, reading, and publishing trans life today is Joe Livingstone. Joe was the recipient of the 2020 Noah Balakian Citation for Excellence in Reviewing. They have written for the New York Times, the Times Literary Supplement and elsewhere. They're a contributing editor at the Public Domain Review and hold a PhD in medieval literature from NYU. Please welcome Joe Livingstone. Thank you so much, Ruben, for that fulsome um, and really, really sweet introduction. Oh, uh, Joe, I can't hear you. You can't hear me at all? Can you hear me now? Fabulous. We can keep going then. Thanks, Dan Michelle. So thank you for that wonderful introduction. Um, I have wanted to put this panel together for a while. Um, I'm so grateful to Barnard's Center for Research on Women for their support to our ASL interpreters for um, helping us tonight. 
and um, also to a lot of individual donors who um, supported our honorary fund. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce to you Casey Platt, who is the author of A Dream of a Woman, Little Fish, A Safe Girl to Love, co-editor of Meanwhile Elsewhere, science fiction and fantasy from transgender writers, and the publisher at Little Puss Press. She has written for the New York Times, Harper's Bazaar, The Guardian, The Globe and Mail, McSweeney's Internet Tendency, The Winnipeg Free Press, and other publications. A winner of the Amazon First Novel Award, the Firecracker Award for Fiction, and a two-time winner of the Lambda Literary Award. Her work has also been nominated for the Scotiabank, is that right, Giller Prize? Fab. Um, she splits her time between New York City and Windsor, Ontario. Welcome, Casey. Thank you, Joe. Thank you so much for having me here. Thank you for joining us. I will move on to C. Riley Snorton, who is professor, professor of English and Gender and Sexuality Studies at the University of Chicago. He is a cultural theorist who focuses on racial, sexual, and transgender histories and cultural productions. He is the author of Nobody is Supposed to Know, Black Sexuality on the Down Low, and Black on Both Sides, A Racial History of Trans Identity, and co-editor of Saturation, Race, Art, and the Circulation of Value. He is also the co-editor of the flagship journal in Queer Studies, GLQ, a journal of GLBTQ studies published by Duke University Press. I elided some publication info there, so please chase down those references because all of those publications are fantastic. Thanks so much, Joe, and uh, really excited for the conversation. Thank you. Moving on, we have Kay Gabriel, who is a poet and an essayist. She's the author of A Queen in Bucks County and Kissing Other People or The House of Fame. With Andrea Abikaram, she co-edited We Want It All, an anthology of radical trans poetics. She lives in Queens. Thanks to be here, thanks for having me. Thank you. Um, moving on, we have Den Michelle Norris, who is the editor-in-chief of Electric Literature, winner of the 2022 Whiting Literary Magazine Prize where she is the first black openly trans woman to helm a major literary publication. A 2021 Out 100 honoree, her writing has been supported by McDowell, Tin House, VCCA, and the Kimbilio Center for African American Fiction, and appears in McSweeney's American Short Fiction and Apogee Journal. She co-hosts the critically acclaimed podcast, Food for Thought, that's T-H-O-T, and her debut novel, When the Harvest Comes, is forthcoming from Random House. Welcome, Don Michelle. Thank you so much. It's great to be here. Last but very much not least, we have Neon Yang, who is a Singaporean writer of science fiction and fantasy. They are the author of The Genesis of Misery and the, is it Tensorit? Am I saying that right? Or fantastic, series of novellas. The Red Threads of Fortune, The Black Tides of Heaven, The Descent of Monsters, and The Ascent to Godhood. Their work has been shortlisted for the Hugo, Nebula, World Fantasy, Lambda Literary, and Locus Awards, while the Tensorate novels were an otherwise award honoree in 2018. They are queer and non-binary and live in the UK. Welcome, Leanne. Hi, thank you so much for having me. It's, it's an honor. I am honored to be joined by um, such a powerhouse array of people from different sectors within this industry we call literature. I'm so excited to speak with you all and hopefully compare notes from the different places that we work within the culture. I would like to kick things off by mentioning an essay that Kay Gabriel recently published. Well, pretty recently published in the um, Yale Review. It's a fantastic piece called Who's Trans Realism? Um, Nevada and the Fiction of Fucking Up. And um, Kay, would you be interested in, in sort of briefly stating how you came to this essay and what kind of argument you, you knew that you wanted to make? Yeah, for sure. Um, can everyone hear me? Perfect. Wonderful, great. Um, uh, so, um, 
I remember when Nevada first came out from Topside Press, Nevada by Image and Vinny, um, really fantastic novel that I imagine many people in the audience, probably not everyone, um, has read. Um, so um, that's, you know, their first piece of homework. Um, and uh, it was re it came out in 2013. Um, it was re-released in 2022 um, from FSG. Um, uh, and I, um, uh, Sam Huber at the Yale Review um, uh, approached me about writing an essay about Nevada. Um, and I was like, cool. That's an interesting idea. What I actually want to do is talk about both like what made Nevada possible because it's a remarkable achievement, but not a singular one. It couldn't be, right? Um, and also what has what has sort of um, descended from it, so to speak. Um, and why this form of um, fiction is compelling. And so basically I talk a little bit in that essay about um, the kind of moment of um, trans fiction that um, developed um, kind of just before Nevada was published um, and some of the other authors who were kind of in um, Imogen's like immediate orbit, not that that's the only thing that was going on, but just so we can sort of see what's happening, right? Um, and then I also basically, I mean, like the main argument is that, you know, like there's this thing that people say that, oh, you know, everything was like trans memoir and then, you know, and then, and then um, let's say we have a, you know, a kind of like the cultural explosion of the past 10 years and, and all of a sudden these previously conservative genres were, were displaced. And in broad outline, that story is true, but um, I guess in this essay, what I want people to see is that the thing that's being contested is a kind of realism. Um, uh, and, um, specifically, um, what I think is really interesting in Imogen's book, and not just Imogen's book, I think a lot of other people do this as well, um, is um, uh, a form of, of like um, showing trans life without spectacularizing, without making a spectacle of pain, right? Um, because the thing that to me is deeply disinteresting, and I promise this will be the end of the summary, right? The thing that to me is deeply disinteresting in like um, any, we could say like minoritarian literature is writing something so that somebody who's kind of a tourist looking in can feel, can read it and then feel good about feeling bad. Like that I think is just totally fucking boring. Um, and, 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 you know, like makes people into interesting little spectacles. I think it just, I think it just sucks. And so one of the things that's really interesting about Imogen's book is she makes that impossible. Um, and I think a lot of other people do an interesting job of that. Um, the point here is about writing a realism in which people can be understood to be the authors of their own lives, right? Um, and I think recognizing that people are, um, agents and neither um, uh, cute little victims nor um, strange individual perverts, um, although we may in fact be perverts and some of us are also victims, um, uh, like writing a, a literature in which people are understood to be at least partly the authors of their conditions is very interesting to me. And that's what I say in that essay. That was a great summary, frankly, Thank of you. a complicated essay. Um, thank you so much. I thought that it might give us a place to have a jumping off point from because I think there are some things that you state very concisely, Kay, in this piece, which are um, conditions which I think affect everybody working in literature, perhaps, um, despite the many differences that maybe we could go into. So I'm gonna um, quote Kay quoting. 
In the essay, uh, Kay quotes the editors of Trapdoor, trans, -cult trans cultural production and the politics of visibility. Visibility is neither the goal of liberatory polit political projects, nor especially helpful towards achieving them. Um, complicated statement, fascinating, I think, very generative. My question to you each as professionals who are really just doing fantastic work in the work that you do. Um, how do you define the sector of um, the literary and cultural industries that you work in that could be a genre or a type of job? Um, and how do you personally balance this particular um, uh, pr pressure from the outside? So how, yeah, how do you balance external pressure for with the need for your own sake to do work that feels authentic. That question is authentic to yourself. That question's a little bit muddy, but hopefully you'll, we can start with what we do and then see where we get. Um, I would like to invite Riley to kick us off. Yeah, great. You know, I, I, I wanna say that um, I really appreciate the question and the citation. Uh, from Tourmaline and Eric Stanley and uh, Joanna Burton's book Trapdoor, because I think what they're talking about in terms of visibility also like meaningfully foregrounds a question about capitalism and racial capitalism in particular as it relates to the authors of that statement, um, which I think is 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 often a way to really think through the kind of um, um, various kinds of external pressures. So certainly as I'm working in an academic context, um, it invites me to think about the politics of writing and my writerly practice. It also makes me think about all the kind of other facets of work that I think still remain part of the cultural industries as a mentor and a teacher, uh, as it relates to doing collaborative projects with other kinds of artists. Um, and, you know, I think in some ways I have found at this stage in my career um, a kind of relative autonomy in, or in, in, in terms of being able to um, set forward a set of questions. But I think there's also something about the, the um, formats in which I am writing, which um, are incredibly citational and, and, and in that way also... Um, you know, in some ways, I think, deeply collaborative, um, that like, I don't necessarily uh, maybe approach the question in terms of authenticity, but autonomy. And I also think about it in terms of like, um, like one of the things that I actually value and enjoy about my work as an academic writer is that um, it really gives me an opportunity to be quite transparent about a kind of politics of citation and how those things were shaped, which to throw another compliment on to Kay's um, amazing essay, I really loved the way that you kind of think about the citate, citationality amongst um, creative writers as well. That I think that, you know, there's a myth of the singular author, there's a myth of the kind of exceptional figure that I think, um, um, you know, I'm really excited to kind of talk with other writers working in other industries um, in thinking about how we also kind of buck that um, that understanding as well. Thank you so much. That was fascinating. And it makes me want to punt the question next to Dan Michelle, um, being a, a worker in a variety of institutions throughout your career, but different ones, um, you know, nobody needs to say anything confidential about their working lives or their current employer that's not going to be held against anybody but how do you take the question um well um I thank you so much I think one of the things that I am hearing in sort of every aspect of this conversation is um conversations about power and um I think the emphasis on autonomy is really important because so often um, that is sort of taken from trans folks, particularly in conversations about our lives and in the telling of our stories. And so for me, um, the really exciting thing about my work life is that, you know, being the editor in chief of electric literature, um, perhaps I should start by really quickly giving a quick overview of electric literature for those who may be unaware. Electric literature is um, a digital literary magazine that publishes short fiction, poetry, poetry, 
prose in the form of essays, book lists, and author interviews. And we publish twice a day, five days a week. Everything we publish is available online for free. We've been around since 2009 and we have annually 3.5 million readers. Um, and so we, we, as a sort of prominent literary journal, um, the really great thing about us is that we really get to help set the tone and, and get to be sort of tastemakers um, for the literary side of things, the creative side of things. Um, literary journals are often the first folks to publish um, young emerging new writers and sort of sort of discover voices that need to be read and give them a platform. And because we're as prominent as we are, we actually even have the ability to sometimes help writers get set up to really build their career um, and go from, you know, barely having published to maybe having an agent, maybe getting book deals and things like, like that because, our, because we give them visibility by publishing them. And so um, I, for the first time in this job, I um, really have begun to kind of understand the idea of having power and, and sort of grabbing it and taking it and doing something intentional with it. And for me, of course, that is elevating um, the stories of trans and gender nonconforming writers, and particularly trans and gender nonconforming writers of color. Um, and so that is at the core of everything that I want to do um, as an editor right now, as an editor at a journal, eventually maybe as an editor in a different kind of forum. Um, that's, that's just simply, um, I mean, that's kind of it. For most of my adult life, I just wanted to be a writer. And then I started editing and I got this job and I was like, oh, look what I can do with this job because there's so, um, there, there's, there's a dearth of, of our stories being told by us, um, not just on the page, but everywhere in the media. I mean, we don't have to talk about, you know, what's happening at the New York Times right now, um, although we may, but um, where are our voices in these pieces that are being written? So. Um, where is the consideration for that? And so for me, this is like a big, huge um, thing that that is just sort of very urgent and immediate. And it is at the core of what I'm doing at EL. And we appreciate you so much. Um, thank you. I wish that I immediately want to interrogate you about taking power, right? That, that <laughs> notion, but um, we must turn to our wonderful novelist. Um, and Neon, I, you're in a, a different country to the rest of us and you work in a, a, a genre that's perhaps more distinct than um, many other types of genres. Um, uh, how do you take the question? Um, hi, uh, I'm Neon and I am a writer of science fiction and fantasy um, and I write novels that are all set on places other than planet Earth, uh, which is my personal choice, really. And um, I think my approach to this question is a bit different. I'm not, a, I'm not an academic. I'm like the least academic person I know. Um, and my writing is very commercial in a sense and like leaning on the pulpy, so in, in, in the pulpy sort of direction. And I think for me, um, I think I have been very fortunate in that I have throughout the course of my career have found like great support um, from people who are in places of power, you know, from agents and editors uh, who have like, you know, uh, decided to publish me. Um, and, and I feel like, I do feel like I have been given like a certain amount of freedom to write. Um, whatever what well, I would I wouldn't say whatever I want but I have had not as I've not had much pushback I shall say uh in writing about things that I want to in the way that I want to and I understand that that's not a um that's not maybe common but I think I have somehow managed to lend myself in a space that is progressive enough that like um, I can write about all the weird kind of gender stuff that I want to, and and people like it, uh, which I have been very fortunate uh, in that respect. Um, I think for me, the way I approach this in my work is that I am someone who likes to imagine worlds, right? Uh, for me, 
a lot of what the work I do is escapism and, you know, which kind of leans into its commercial nature because, you know, sometimes people just want to read about things that are different and interesting and not have to think about, you know, the world we live in for a while. And when I create worlds, I think one of the things that always stands out to me is that I can think about gender in a different way, right? Um, so I'm always looking at different at, at ways to sort of like express that um, in an interesting way. I think I've said interesting a lot in one sentence, but um, I'm also the kind of person who tends to just include you know, gender stuff because, uh, I mean, I don't tend to write like, you know, memoir or or um, sort of like, I don't want to call it message fiction, but I don't want to write stories about being trans um, specifically, but they are stories in which transness is felt throughout. Um, and those are different things to me. Um, and I think it's also like, yeah, sorry. I think that was the point I wanted to make. Yeah. <laughs> Leon, thank you. No, that was an incredibly well articulated um, point. And it's a really helpful pivot also and towards the thoughts of Casey Platt working in a different type, um, a different field within the field. Uh, how do you take the question? Uh, sorry, can you repeat the question again? Yeah, sure. Just make sure I have it right. I basically, I gave a quote and I will read it again, which is, visibility is neither the goal of liberatory political projects nor especially helpful towards achieving them. My question was, what specific sector do you feel you work in, in the literary cultural apparatus? Um, and how has this dynamic of pressure to be visible and the pressure to create authentic or autonomous work, how do you, how do you handle that? Right, right, right. Totally. Thank you for the refresher. Um, uh, Riley, I really love what you said about being autonomous um, and sort of thinking about that alongside the idea of authenticity. Um, I definitely feel very similarly, especially with my publish, uh, with the publishing work that we do at Little Plus Press. Um, I think we're very concerned with uh, the question of autonomy and making sure that, I mean, it's a two woman operation that me and my business partner, Kat Fitzpatrick, run. Um, and we're very dedicated to um, making sure that we are making the decisions, the two of us, and that there are not um, there are not other people who are um, could potentially offer things to us, but then would be also then making those decisions instead. Um, I do actually really bifurcate uh, this, this, to answer your question largely. I bifurcate it very severely between being a writer and then being like not just a publisher, but a uh, sort of like a literary citizen, basically, which would include like being on this panel. Um, so as a literary citizen, uh, if I, that might sound like a bit of um, a pretentious term, so forgive me, but bear with me. Um, uh, I do think a lot about, um, I do think a lot about how visibility is working. I do think a lot about what the political goals of literature can be. I do think a lot about representation and I think about sort of what the right moves are while not being um, tokenizing or pigeonholing. Um, as an artist, as a writer, I very much resist thinking about those things and I don't want to. Um, and I sometimes can get, get even a little bit persnickety when I see people sort of try to put my work within that context. Um, and, um, uh, and, and it is a little bit too neat to attempt to bifurcate these things too neatly because of course they bleed into each other for sure. You know, um, it's, not, it's not that simple. Um, but uh, but I do um, as a as a writer as an artist and maybe particularly as an editor as an editor you know um, we'll split that off in there as well as sort of maybe differently from being a publisher um, I um, I tend to think that God at getting sort of caught up in these in these questions of what is this visibility doing and what is being made visible and what does that mean to the world? Um, I um, 
I, I think if I was asking myself those questions as I was writing and as I was trying to make fiction and as I'm trying to make novels and I'm trying to get to the truth at something, um, I think I would not be able to make those things. Um, which doesn't mean, I mean, which doesn't mean to say it doesn't have effects. And I'm interested in what, say, cultural critics have to say about the effects of that work, for sure. Um, but um, when, I'm, when I'm writing those things, I think it can be at best unproductive towards the work and at worst counterproductive to whatever those goals might be. Thank you. I, I love that you have such a clearly articulated strategy in your mind. Because sometimes just putting the word strategy at the top of a piece of paper is like my morning. <laughs> then I, you know, strategic thinking being a, a goal, I think for a lot of people now. And it really strikes me. Um, it strikes me how, and I was kind of pushing this point earlier, the differences in genre between where you work and where Neon works has a really big effect on the way that these issues about, you know, is gender stuff visible in the work, right? I think that the science fiction has a really specific um, uh, constituency that like, I don't really know that much about, but I know this, you know, it's, it's not necessarily the same as the literary novel, which is a very hotly debated what the boundaries are of it. Um, so that's interesting to me. Now that we've kind of gotten going, and this is, it's just already fascinating, the resonances um, to me. Can we talk about genre? Um, <laughs> this is a, a question I've been wanting to attack for so long. And what I needed was you <laughs> in order to pose the question and maybe get an answer. But um, do you think that trans literature, no, not do you think, have you found referring to literature as trans literature helpful to you in any way? Like, is this a genre that is being disowned by writers at the same time that publishers are creating new markets, right? Um, that's my, my, not disowned, wrong word. People have a complicated relationship to uh, the idea of a genre, I think, being connected to the word trans. And um, it doesn't quite sync up necessarily with the way that like, the marketing of literature is going. So um, yeah, what do, you, what do you think? I'm gonna uh, let anybody take this one who wants to leap in. Can I jump in? Please. Amazing. So yeah, um, I think, so I'm gonna be maybe a little controversial here. Um, I think that trans literature as a category is so it's in a, in a way is it its own genre well we could sort of you could be like a bit pedantic and go like well there's so many genres within it so probably no um but I, I also think like another way to think about this problem is like why is it interesting and why is it useful like what is what is the intervention right um what is the intervention in the moment that it emerged out of you could say that trans literature like as such is like 10 to 15 years old right so there there was a period that produced it and then it got big right or kind of big um some some books got big um and now and that's and you could say we're kind of at the end of maybe a decade of that and so you, one might ask, you know, what's like, what is the next 10, what is our project for the next 10 years? Like, that's one, that's one way of asking a question. And I mean, I think like the way that I answer that, and I, 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 I really feel what Casey said just now, um, when I answer this question as an editor um, and like a curator, and when I answer it as a poet and an essayist and a writer, um, I answer it in kind of a, diff a different way, right? But like, you know, I do wanna have an eye on what our conditions are and what we're trying to change, right? And, and that is not, I don't want that to be like just totally instrumentalizing, but like, you know, we write things to, to, to um, stretch the possibilities for like language and social relations and like thought and consciousness um, uh, so that um, life can be different and um, sensuous and um, uh, 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 be revealed somehow in a way that it 
currently is not. Like they were, they were trying to do something. So, you know, from that perspective, I also think about what we're doing as part, I really don't mean this to sound, to, to sound instrumentalizing or to turn like culture into an instrument of like a political project or something. But I do think about like trans literature to the extent that it is useful and is interesting as part of like the cultural front of a large and complex um, and interesting and urgent um, social and political movement, right? And I, you know, I think to the extent that it's a useful category, it's because that other information and that other, that other stuff is urgent, right? And, 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 you know, like, so, I, you know, when, when Dan Michelle was talking about like, oh, there's a dearth of us telling our stories and our voices and it's so necessary right now, like, I totally agree. And the question is like, oh, well, why is it necessary right now? I mean, like, there, and, and, and so that, that's kind of what I mean by like trans literature being useful and coherent insofar as it's like the cultural front of a social and political movement, right? And, and just to kind of illustrate a little bit more, you know, we all kind of know this because we all read the news, but you know, I, like I teach a trans studies class at NYU at, as an adjunct. Um, and so I have to say this to my students all the time, right? I ask them, why, why are you taking this class? And they're like, well, I, you know, I, I read the news. And I'm like, ah, yes, it's so interesting to be literally in the news. Um, all the time, right? You know, so, so like, what is the situation that we're trying to change? Well, there is, you know, there's like wide ranging liberal apathy um, to, or like, you know, you know, you know like occasional, um, again, uh, interest in the spectacle of our lives against a backdrop of apathy. And there is a very intentional right wing culture war that is being waged against us right and it's being waged somewhat cynically from people like Christopher Rufo um and then it's being way and, and, and who are are like oh well let's just find like some culture war stuff to put into to, and see what sticks right and then it's being waged as a kind of like state making project by like say like the Ron DeSantis administration and then clearly there's a kind of like social movement side to this as well right and I, I don't want us to, to get like just purely distracted by all of that because they shouldn't set the terms of this conversation and I, I promise I'll, sh I'll shut up after this but, <laughs> but just like you know when we think well I am we're changing like we're culture workers like like the people on this on this panel are culture workers um, we are attempting to do whatever else we do. We are um, uh, uh, working within the cultural sphere. We're working in, in language and we're working in you know, image and whatever else it is, right? Um, but we should just be aware that always this is our situation that we are desperately um, and um, uh, with great originality and focus um, attempting to find a way out of, right? And a different um, path forward from and a different, um, uh, a different life world from. Um, and that to me, so it's not like a genre question, but it's, it's right. like a question of what is the project? And that, that's what that is for me. Thank you. Um, yeah, I think that was really helpful. Sorry, Neon, you go. No, no, if you had, because I, I wanted to sort of just like jump in on that, I think, uh, on what case it, because I think it's, yeah, I, I am actually in sort of two ways about this, because personally, I don't think that it's helpful to sort of like lump all of like trans literature under one monolith, because there's just so much of it. But as, as what case said that there is this culture war going on, and um, art has been described as a reflection of the anxieties of the society we live in, right? And, you know, it's a reflection of the society, uh, the, the anxieties of the artists as well. And the fact that we do actually live in the environment that we do live in now is a powerful force that shapes the narratives that we come out 
up with even in our art so I feel like I wish we could live in a world where like there is no need for this label of, of trans literature and that there can be as many different forms of trans narrative as there are you know trans lives uh, because you know it's a great white incredible diverse group um but I think that the reality we live in can also cannot be ignored as well and um and I think that's whether we want to or not there I think there will be certain sort of like commonalities within trans literature um and that's just how it's how it is and how it's going to be yeah anyone else want to jump in real quick I mean, I would jump in quickly and say that I, um, similar to Neon, I'm also sort of of two minds because on the one hand, as an editor, um, right, who's getting to, to shape narratives that are going into world that are not necessarily my own narratives or my own, certainly not my own writing, um, I think of it, I think in much the same way that Kay thinks of it. I think of it less as something that has to do specifically with like the art and it's more to me about the project, the political project. I think that what's happening with um, trans folks right now is so urgent that it's hard, it's hard not to think of it in that way for me as an as an editor and in my role. Um, and that, as an editor, I embrace that. That excites me. Um, that motivates me, and that guides a lot of my decision making. Um, I'm also a writer. Right, I have my own book coming out, and I find that as a writer, that sort of hyper visibility that we have right now um, completely stresses me out, and it doesn't help me get my writing done. To think about it in that way, to think about it outside of it being a piece of art, um, there's like political connotations to the way that I think about why I write and who I'm writing for and who my sort of ideal write reader is in my head when I'm like in the earliest stages even of sketching out a piece of fiction. But um, in terms of actually getting the work done, putting all that sort of extra political context and visibility does not help me. Um, and so that's a thing that I also have to think about as an editor, one, because I don't, I, I have to in some ways keep those things separate. And two, as an editor who works with writers, um, I feel as though I, there's a, I can't necessarily take all of that that I'm thinking about as an editor and I'm thinking about the bigger purpose of everything and, and what kinds of stories I want to steward into the world and why. I don't necessarily, it's not my place, I don't think to necessarily place that on the writers that I'm working with who I'm going to publish um, because I know what the weight of that feels like. And so it's a very, it, it ends up being a very challenging thing because our, we are in many ways in the cultural spotlight right now and cultural wars are being raged against us by doofuses like Christopher Rufo and many others. Um, and and every, every one of us has to figure out how we navigate that while continuing to get our um, very important work of writing done and out into the world. Absolutely. Um, personally, I sometimes feel the pressure to be extremely clarifying, but that's also because of my conditioning, because I was conditioned growing up to respond well to pressure rather than in the, and, but I say different things than I would be saying if the pressure wasn't there. Um, I would love for um, Riley to take the, this discussion of genre to the academic sphere because um, it's doing something different, right? Doing different work. Yeah, sure. I mean, I do think that that what's been said, um, I feel a lot of resonance with um, in terms of, you know, like in some ways, like I'm like, you, I, there is a kind of sensibility that I have about working in the field of trans studies that is also kind of um, anti-calcification uh, or anti-nominalization, like right? Like I'm like, 
much more interested in thinking about trans as always a context for thinking about encounter. Um, and I and and in relation to the kind of question of genre, then I'm also interested in as I think everyone is sort of laying out, like genre is another way of kind of thinking about a political project. So I mean, coming into trans studies for me has been through Black feminisms and Black studies. And so like to, to think about like trans literature as an object that somehow is, um, uh, that we can think of outside of those frames, <laughs> like just feels like an impossibility. Like it's, it's, it's in the um, it's in the kind of relation that trans itself implies that I'm most interested. Now, I do think a lot about trans genres, but I'm not sure about thinking about trans literature as a genre. Fascinating distinction. I think that's really, really, really interesting. Um, what I'm hearing from a lot of people is that the phrase trans literature can be used to do work that cannot be done otherwise, but is very different to the from the very differently felt from person to person. Um, Casey, yeah, I think that the, the question of genre somehow comes in between your split, <laughs> your, your, your bifurcated angles of, of work. Um, would you agree or whatever you want to say? I think, you know, the, I was thinking about this, this, like when it comes to the question of like trans literature as a genre, I find myself actually just really excited to like hear what other people have to think and read and about that stuff. I don't actually, that's actually a field of all this where I don't feel like I have much to offer and I'm not interested in figuring out what to offer. One of the reasons that I love uh, loved reading Kay's essay, honestly, because it talks about work in the context and conversation with each other. And it doesn't take like, here's, it, it's a great that there is like trans creators and trans cultural workers who are starting to get, um, you know, a little more attention than used to happen. Although I feel complicated about that, but that's a whole other topic. Um, but it's always so much like alone and so much these like soul people. And so, and I, don't think I see often people talking about, you know, our work that's, uh, that is not taking place in a vacuum and that is in conversation with each other, whether consciously or not. Um, I would love to see a lot more of that. And I'm literally just talking here as like a reader, as a consumer, like I want to read these things. Um, I am so curious what other people might think about what our work is doing. Um, so when it comes to this question of like trans literature as a genre, what does that mean? Uh, yeah, I honestly don't really have a great answer. And I am just like super excited to hear uh, what other people think about that. In keeping, uh, however, um, uh, on the flip side of that, it's like more like an industry side of it. I mean, like, I want to see, um, you know, I want to see, uh, more people in the pipeline and I want to see more people sort of having access to the machinery behind the background um, who um, are not so are not so visible um, that I'm very much invested in um, and that I feel very dedicated to trying to make some intervention with to whatever degree is in my capability. Thank you, thank you. Um, it strikes me that if genre is a way of just drawing a big circle, right? And the interesting thing to do is, as with Kay, you know, compare, compare the people in the circle and get them to talk to each other. Or you can be a statistician and say, what do all these people inside the circle have in common? <laughs> right? And are the novel and is the work similar in some meaningful way? Um, and to I agree with. I personally feel a lot of pressure to keep my political conscience out of work and you know what I'm just like being evasive because today has been like absolutely insane so <laughs> I'm gonna go back to the idea what I'm trying to get at is that if we these terms are important enough to all of us to use almost every day some in some respect not even directly right but participate with trans literature um and yet the conditions of what it is are so complicated then like what is genre <laughs> do you know what i mean that that's what's really kind of um 
it's getting to me in a way. If I could maybe just also get, like leap in here and also just like connect some thoughts. Um, like um, one thing that I think um, is really interesting that, um, so Casey and I just had this like a uh, like conversation in the uh, magazine I run Poetry Project Newsletter with Joss Barton. Sorry for, this, this is not me plugging myself, um, uh, but uh, it's me plugging Casey because she said a really interesting thing about um, uh, Faltas, which is the book that Cecilia Gentili just wrote that um, Little Puss published last year. Um, uh, that's like um, an epistolary memoir, I guess I would describe it. Um, uh, yes, uh, and it is amazing. And please plug it all you want because it's really, rules. really, really, really good. And, you know, one thing that's kind of interesting here, right, um, is um, that, um, so Cecilia is, um, as those of you who are uh, in New York um, probably already know, um, just like wonderful and um, a genius and um, uh, a magnificent storyteller. And um, uh, I, I, the story that, I mean, Casey, you might, you might just sort of leap in and talk about this, um, but uh, so I don't have to tell your, like your thing for you, but basically like, Kat Fitzpatrick from Little Puss, I think went to Cecilia after she gave a performance and was like, you should write a book. Um, and one of the things that Little Puss could do, I mean, th this just comes to mind because Casey was talking about the machinery. One of the things that you guys could do was make it possible for Cecilia to, to access all of the stuff in the publishing world that is normally that is um, really um, uh, forbiddingly um, kept um, secret. Um, and that's really interesting to me because like the, uh, you know, I, I assigned Cecilia's um, oral history project interview in my class and my students love it because it's hilarious and, and really smart and, um, I, and, and she's just extraordinary to listen to. And one of the things I think that Little Puss did was also make her extraordinary, like, like make it possible, you know, she made, she, she, she did it herself, but you know, like you guys like made it possible for her to be extraordinary on the page. That changes what literature is. And to the extent that trans literature is the thing that makes that tangible to people or palpable or, or, or visible to people, or uh, no, a word I don't like, um, uh, perceptible to people, um, that's good. Like that's useful, right? Um, I don't know if-, if, if, if uh, Yeah, I, like that. sure. I think that like the machinery of the literary industry is like pretty calcified and it follows these like sort of rote steps that I don't think I don't think serve books as a whole. I don't necessarily think serves the industry as a cold, even from a cold calculating perspective. It certainly does not serve writers and it definitely does not serve marginalized writers, quote unquote, or writers who are like, just not going to be, have opportunities to get into that, that mat machine uh, uh, in the first place are, are less likely to. I think one thing that I'm interested in is like, well, what if we make that machinery collaborative? Like, what if we make that machinery like more like, what if there's ways to kind of like rearrange how we use it? I'm not opposed to using the machinery. I mean, I once had a book that you couldn't get in bookstores and libraries because it wasn't on standard distribution. Like, it's not so easy to just be like, fuck the machinery, man. Like that has lots of costs that I'm not super interested that I, I, I don't, um, I, 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 you know, I don't, I don't, um, uh, I think are usually often worth it, but I am interested in like, what happens if we start making more of that stuff collaborative, you know, like, what if like, like you're doing this thing that's amazing and we're doing these things. What if we made a book together? Like, I don't think that's the kind of thing that you often see in the literary industry. So what if we started doing more things like that? Um, and you know, this is um, this is uh, obviously very germane to Cecilia's book and how Faltas came about, but that's an attitude that like, um, I think could like serve us well and I would love to see more of. 
Thank you. Does that does that make sense, Kate? Does that get to what you're saying at all? I'm gonna keep going if that's okay, because we're gonna only go until about eight thirty, and we're gonna. Oh my goodness gracious! It's already so late. It's okay. Um, what I'm gonna do is squish together the question left that I really wanted to ask and a, a question that somebody's already submitted, um, which is a good one about. Uh, you know, what would you recommend as influential texts? And um, the essay about Nevada and its uh, role in many people's lives, right? Lives <laughs> uh, is um, what would be your three books or articles or anything that if somebody came to you and said, I've never heard of trans people <laughs> or um, would like to have approach this genre somehow sorry not don't imagine that nobody ever anyone ever said they never heard of trans people that's ridiculous what would you say uh three titles are that um you would really like somebody to read and that may may not come across um and i'm going to ask neon to go first Hey, goodness. Um, so when I saw this question asked, uh, I actually came up with a list of three titles and they're just books that I like. And I am now sitting here thinking like, well, I don't know if these are like meant to be like a syllabus. And I'm going to retract. I retract it's just all books that I've read and I liked. So I, my three recommendations are Sorrow Land by River Solomon, The Four Profound Wees by R.B. Lamberg, and Freshwater by Aqua Kim Imezi, uh, that are just like genre trans literature that are genre books that I really enjoyed. And that's, that's it. That's the only <laughs> um, qualification. I like them a lot and I want more people to read them because I think they're good. <laughs> incredible this, having <laughs> incredible this. Yeah, you know, having reviewed Freshwater when it came out, I was just like, why didn't reviews follow everywhere? But um, thank you so much. Who would like to go next? Like a seminar leader, I will call on you. <laughs> why don't we go with Dan Michelle? I was fully about to um, go anyway. So, I mean, I like many people have have read it. It's sort of seminal, but I just have to say that I'm I'm still obsessed with um with with uh, Tori Peters' novel. It's it's absolutely um, extraordinary, and I feel like it. You know, it's very popular, but I just think that um, the transition Detran baby is yeah, it's just extraordinary. So that's one. Um, there and then I actually turn I for for trans stuff I've turned a lot to poetry, um, and so I really love the collection um, "Boy with Thorn" by Ricky Laurentis. Um, being read sort of with it as it was and with an understanding of the time that has passed since it's been published. Um, I think is really important in, in an interesting lens to go back and reread that book. And then um, I really, really love everything by Janice Smith, everything. Um, Homie is spectacular. So I've been really finding it in poetry. I would have said Nevada as well, but you know, that's coming. Oh, and okay. Now I haven't really read this yet because it hasn't come out yet, but you should. we should all be looking at it, its memoir, but we should all be looking for Raquel Willis's book that publishes later this year. Um, I think it's called The Bravery to Bloom. It's something along those lines. Um, so sorry, I that was more than enough for me. I think that in real time you edited back down to three, which is, you know, that's incredible. <laughs> Who wants to go next? I'll jump in, especially because so many of the authors uh named are ones that were on my list in some way so I also wanted to lift up a quick Mezzi's pet as well um and um I was also thinking about poetry um and I was thinking about Cam Awkward Rich's uh collections of poems um Sympathetic Little Monster and Dispatch and 
also uh, his book, The Terrible We. So I, I kind of decided to go by author rather than <laughs> um, by number of works. Um, and, um, you know, I am, um, you know, like deeply uh, enjoying a book that I actually just picked up from another critic who's a novelist as well, Matt Richardson's Black Canvas, which just recently came out at the beginning of the year. Amazing, thank you. KCK? Yeah, I'll, uh, I'll go next. I am going to brazenly cheat and say more than three, sorry. Um, I hope uh, there's, I hope we choose love by Kai Cheng Tong, which is a book of essays, which is like really, really beautiful um, and really, really fucking smart. And it came out in 2018, um, but it's concerned with a lot of topics um, of catastrophe um, and of how to sort of work together and be good to one another within catastrophe and specifically within trans communities and queer communities um, that is um, uh, particularly, I think, uh, salient uh, at the moment as well. Um, uh, Everyone on the Moon is Essential Personnel, uh, which is a short story collection by Julian K. Jarbo. It's like, what am I maybe like, I don't know. It's like one of my like favorite uh, like story collections period. It's so gorgeous. My, the novella in the middle of it is like one of my favorite things I have ever read. It makes me absolutely weep. Um, uh, Small Beauty by Jo Ching Wilson Yang, which is a novel that came out like a few years ago. And it's really like, it's really like quiet. It's really, really beautiful. Um, it, it got, it like won a Lambda, um, but I feel like I haven't really heard much about it in the last few years. It came out in 2016 and I would really, uh, uh, I think everyone should, should go back and read Small Beauty if they've read it and should go read it if they haven't heard it, if they haven't heard of it before. I'm and then finally, okay. To quickly to ask if you could restate your titles, just oh, a sure little thing. slowly for interpretation. Just sure thing. up the last ones and then keep going, but just slow yeah. with the titles would be helpful. I hope we choose love. It's an essay collection. Everyone on the moon is essential personnel. It's a short story collection. Uh, Small Beauty, which is a novel. And then finally, uh, there is an essay online uh, called The Seam of Skin and Scales um, by Elena Rose Vera, blogging as Little Light. Um, that is uh, just one of the most powerful things I've ever read still over many years and that um, I think about daily. Um, and it's it's online. I'm going to drop it in the chat if that is okay. It sure is. Thank you so much, um, Rodney. Would you drop in the chat if you would like anybody else to to restate um, their titles? That would be helpful. Thanks so much, um, Kay. What do you have on your list? Um, yeah, um, everyone did more than three, so I guess I will too. Um, uh, um, I'm going to start with poetry. Um, I, uh, the, so the, the author is um, Trish um, Sala, um, and the book is called, um, uh, I'm going to just type it out, um, uh, the book is called Lyric Sexology, Volume 1. Um, it's an incredible, incredible book. Um, I teach it in my trans poetry class in the fall, and like I teach it my, my students, I teach it's the first book I teach um, right after this poem by Holly Raymond that I also love called Mall is Lost, um, which is like Christina Rossetti's Goblin Market, except it's a mall. The students love that one too. But um, when I teach um, Trish's book, um, everyone's like, oh, this is really hard. I don't know. It's asking me to sort of imagine history in a way that feels very uncomfortable. Um, and then imme and immediately they write their first essays and they all get really smart, um, which to me is proof that um, you can give people something really hard. Um, and then you just give them the scaffolding they need to like um, climb up it. Um, and then they're like, oh wait, I can do it. Um, uh, and I can think, and, and it's like really interesting for um, thinking up in a really, um, complicated, powerful, I'll say um, dialectical way 
about like gender and history um, and desire um, in a way that a lot of us say we want to do, but then Trish actually does it. It's so fucking good. Um, uh, and it is available um, from Roof Books. Um, uh, next author on my list, um, Bryn Kelly, um, who passed away in 2016, um, as I'm sure some people on the call will remember vividly. Um, and um, uh, she blogged for prettyqueer.com as a gossip columnist, columnist called The Hussy. And frankly, I just think that you can only access this from archive.org at this point, like through the Wayback Machine. Um, and I just think, you know, every couple of months, someone asks a question that Bryn already answered. Um, and, and I just think, and she answered it with a lot more humor and grace and a certain degree of um, sinfulness that uh, none of us can really aspire to. And I, I just I just think that um, everyone should do themselves a favor and, and read what she has to say. Um, she has a, a public writing available. And my, my final one is, um, uh, I wonder if this counts as translate. Um, I, I, is Daryl by Jackie S. I think it counts. Um, uh, <laughs> I, I, I'm going to say that it counts as trans literature, and if Jackie disagrees, then I'm sure I'll hear from her. Um, but I, I just really think it's genius. Um, I, um, and, and it's related to what, what Riley was talking about before with the, I mean, I talk about it in my essay, right? But um, it's related to what Riley was talking about before about like citationality, because one of the things that's interesting about Daryl is that it like takes place in the same world as Dennis Cooper's book, The Sluts, and also the same world kind of, you could say, as Nevada. It's like really interesting that it, it's just like, oh, this fictional universe is actually um, uh, 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 stealing from, and I say stealing <laughs> a good thing, uh, um, these other these other books that um, provide um, such cool for So those are those are my three. Thank you so much, Kay. I appreciate that. Speaking of Bryn Kelly, incredible, incredible author. I think whenever we say the words trans literature, there are always ghosts invoked. People who have passed away, friends, uh, writers. Right. This is a. Um, a literary culture in the present moment, which is missing, you know, scores and scores and scores of voices who should have been here. So I wanted to connect that to a question from the chat. I hope Ruben, it's okay if I do that and just dip right in, cause I'm, I'm gonna. So, um, oh, actually Ruben, this was Ruben's question. So I will take that as a yes. As writers, how do we feel about the historical erasure of queer literary figures and how does it influence in keeping our voices alive in a fast moving technology? Um, I was a medievalist for a long time. That's what I taught at universities. And um, there are trans people in medieval literature as a something that I found out and double checked and double checked and double checked in the last week was that there was an arrest in 1394 of um, a trans woman <laughs> um, on suspicion of the crime of sodomy in England. Um, so I, when we talk about trans literature coming, being a phenomenon of the last 10, 15 years, I think we're talking about publishing and audience um, and the infinity of time <laughs> is full of everybody else. <laughs> um, how do you deal with that? By, and I'll clarify, how do you deal with the um, the hole where publishing could have been before, the absence of forebears, or forebears that you've found in the past? You know, I just want to extend this conversation to deep time. Um, I don't, I'm really grateful for the question, and I don't have, like, 
I mostly just want to hear what everyone else has to say. Uh, I will say the only thing I can think of is that I try to resist anytime someone uses the word first. Um, when people talk about us as new are the first this or the new kind of stuff is this. Um, no. Absolutely. I recently, sorry to bring this up again. I was recently watching a documentary from 1969 and somebody was talking about the first person to be eaten by a great white shark in Australia. And I just thought, how could you possibly know that? Um, and if, or in some, some particular place. Anyway. <laughs> Other people, what are your thoughts? Dealing with the yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna resist trying to restate the question again, and see if somebody has thoughts about the past. I think I, I venture to say maybe it's so quiet because it's such a complex question that that's really asking us to think both about what I think um, Casey really underlines as like the um, transphobia of moving towards the first in all of these various iterations, especially as it pertains to cultural production and the, um, you know, the loneliness that so many people write about but I think profoundly in the like um introduction to Janet Mock's redefining realness like that kind of loneliness that sits along something like survivor's guilt that like exists when one is seen and and registrable as someone working um and and um existing within certain structures that are like yes, the black a black trans writer is here, right? Um, so, um, you know, I think, I, I think that it's, uh, I, I guess I keep going back to something that I just have been sitting with that Neon said about like, what does it mean to approach those things like more in terms of the feeling and and that's that's like what I'm sitting with is a whole bunch of feelings in this question, like the feeling of, um of uh kind of being out of sync in time i'm thinking about the feeling of like what it means to be exhausted by kind of um you know always producing i'm thinking about the feeling of um of knowing you're not the first but knowing not quite knowing until you know it seems like by some magical circumstance, you can directly connect this back to um, uh, uh, another ant, uh, precedent or another antecedent. Um, yeah, so, you know, it's like, I, I think I, I'm, I'm resisting the idea of trying to polish it up and say like, here's the answer, because I think it is precisely such a, um, like a, a question that has me, uh, feeling all kinds of ways. As soon as I said it, I was thinking that such a great last question because it means I get to force you all to be, you know, good towards concision and, and Riley, you did a fabulous job of that. And yeah, the note that you ended on makes me think that that is the, the or a question, right? Like it's a very, very big question that we are perhaps only now finding the topography of the edge <laughs> that's how I like to think about it with respect to medieval trans people anyway um yeah uh, looking for like the edge of the shadow or something or the edge of the absence um would anybody else like to speak on um the past or are we simply uh, must we look to the future and steam ahead hi so um I would definitely agree with Riley that it's the kind of question that's like you have to really pause and think through it because it does bring up a lot of feelings. I'm um, sorry for that as well. So nobody is obliged to answer this question, please. That's a, that's okay. I think, I, I mean, it's, it's nice to be able to sort of process and think in real time. Um, I am a person who doesn't think of time as a linear concept. I don't feel as though that's why I experience time. Um, 
And so it's interesting because on the one hand, of course, like erasure sucks. Um, I feel as though, you know, for me as a black trans person, I'm always in, I'm in various rooms and various communities dealing with sometimes the erasure of my transness or my queerness in certain spaces and in other spaces, the erasure of my blackness. Um, and knowing that there's like a legacy um, that is behind that um, or like in like a precedent to that. Um, but I also think that um, trans people that I feel like we transcend so many rules and I feel as though, you know, in storytelling, um, time travel becomes real. And um, that is our friend. Um, in regards to the fast moving technological age, that part of it, and maybe this is because I'm the editor of a digital publication, but that part of it is exciting to me. Um, I think about, you know, when I was like just starting to come of age, just moving into college and, and right after college, you know, that was when Facebook was all the rage and everyone was like, don't let there be a picture of you drinking out of a red solo cup or else you'll never get a job. Uh, everything lives forever on the internet. <laughs> and indeed you could scroll through my Facebook page and find those pictures from at this point many years ago. But the point is that um, I think that, the, that there's a way in which um, technology allows us to simultaneously create more permanence and um, you know, the beauty of being an editor at a digital publication is that if there's a typo, if there's an issue, if there's something wrong with a piece, I can have published it and then immediately go back in and like make the correction. That's a very small practical uh, sort of everyday application. But I think what that represents is really interesting um, as well, because it represents the idea that again, the timing, even in that little story is not linear. It's not from here to here necessarily. It's zigzaggy and messy and flexible. And um, those things I think are very good um, in the battle to sort of illuminate what has been erased and what could be erased. That was lovely. Thank you so much. I've been watching Neon's face um, as they contemplate deep time. Um, is there something that um, you'd like to add? Um, I think my question, my answer is, I think, a lot more personal because I've just been like sort of like spinning the question in my head. And based, as somebody who sort of discovered their identity sort of like, you know, recently, I would say in the last uh, five, ten years, I'm not sure what time it's probably five years, but um, I think... Oh, I think a lot of what I came back to was that like there's a lot I don't know personally and like I, I sometimes think about how I would not have realized that I was in cis if I hadn't become decided to become a writer and then like I would just never have come into this knowledge I would just have gone on living my life believing that you know I was a cis woman and and then and I think like what kind of stuck out to me is that you don't know what you don't know like the void that is there um is something that you have to that now that I understand that that would have been a void um it's hard to kind of come to terms with the fact that there was knowledge um, that was hidden from you. And I think about that, I think a lot, um, you know, I, oh, I was thinking about that a lot while trying to ponder an answer to this question um, that there are voids, right? There, I mean, like even today I have learned so much about like trans history that I was not privy to because you know I come from a different culture and it was this was not something that I was raised with and I know that there's so much that I don't know so 
despite all of that, I still have to create, right? Even within these vacuums that I know that I, I sort of occupy, I still have to create. Um, and that is kind of, you know, it's, 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 I think the creation, it's more or less like an obligation to myself as well. Um, so even though I know that I'm completely ignorant of so much. So I think, yeah, that, that, that was basically where my train of thought got to <laughs> when you, you called my name and I was like, oh. <laughs> and yet you said such beautiful things as phrase, uh, the void that would have been there. I think is going to stick in my mind as something extremely expressive. Um, okay, we are closing in on our time. So I know that you're a, a, a classicist. Is that correct from before when you're in academia? So I'm going to expect that you have some thoughts about deep time. Um, do I? I don't know. Um, I, uh, it's an, I am a classicist. That's true. Um, I'm thinking right now of, um, Riley brought up Cam Awkward Rich, and Cam has this, um, really stunning poem that's in Dispatch, I believe, um, called Everywhere We Look, There We Are, and it ha begins with, um, a newspaper excerpt. I looked this up and I forget, but I think it's from, like, 1908, um, and it's about the arrest of um, someone who, reading between the lines, seems to be a Black trans man in, I think, New Orleans or somewhere in Louisiana. It's, there's like a, like a parish as opposed to like a county. Um, and then the rest of the poem is like um, kind of an, an explosion, I think, of, of this newspaper story. Um, and that's also just like, um, that's that's also something that I um, all like assign, it's a poem I assign to my students um, that they um, uh, uh, really vibe with. Um, and I'm like, this is another way of thinking about reaching through a history to touch a moment by way of a reader in the present um, who otherwise wouldn't access it. And I think that's like an interesting, provocative, really meaningful exercise. Um, you know, I mean, the, how to put this? Um, I think that we can like look for a lot of precedents. And sometimes when we look for precedents, we're really keen to establish, oh, I think that this person um, had a similar thing going on. Um, uh, like, and that's exciting when you, when you make that discovery. Um, you know, um, can I yes. Quickly hop off that particular point. Please. Which is that um, we had an advisor in graduate school, uh, Carolyn Dinshaw, who's written very beautifully about the queer touch through history. Um, really, really recommend, really recommend um, her writing yeah. on this. Um, do, do you have like a, a final sentence you wanted to throw in? Because I don't want to <laughs> no, go totally. over time because we'll just disappear mid-sentence. Totally. Um, let me see if there's if there's a neat way to end that thought. Look. Um, I, 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 just, I think that one thing that's notable, right, when we talk about like ephemerality is like queer social life is very rich and has been for, you know, decades. That's a conservative number, decades, right? One of the things that's notable about literature, whatever the limits of that category, is that it it makes this history in a way that like nightlife um, and other other cultural production and other culture work, which is really good and really meaningful, which people is really important to people, doesn't necessarily have, is like it makes it more um, perceptible to people in 10 years or even five years or 50 years, right? Getting your thing into a library is different from a rave poster or a set that people will talk about, but they won't, but won't be recorded or, or transmitted. And that maybe that's fine. This is not me saying, oh, literature is better. Um, like I would, you know, um, that's not, that's not what I'm saying, right? But it's just like, 
one thing that we're trying to do, I think, as like editors and writers is like make a certain way of living perceptible, not just to ourselves, but to like a future readership. And I, I think that that's actually a very valuable, like a really important part of the project that we haven't talked about right now. Um, but it's something yeah. that's really Speaking of the future, um, I would love to finish just one of these conversations with any of you in the future. Um, I've enjoyed this so very much. And um, for viewers, I'd just like to quickly say, you know, thank you so much to Dan Michelle Norris, Neon Yang, KC Plett, C. Riley Snorton, and Kay Gabriel. Um, this has been so much fun. Um, it's been a crazy week. And um, this was also just an honor, just, just an honor to bring you um, here together. So. Uh, yeah, we're, we're, we're wrapping up here now. Um, Ruben, is there anything else that we need to do? Our wonderful tech host? I don't think so, but- um, I, I don't think so. I, I just wanna let everybody know that this event is being recorded and it will be made available uh, on the Book Critics YouTube page and a link uh, will be sent to those who registered for this event. Thank you so much, pending the approval of all of our wonderful panelists. Um, and then we will enter the infinite permanence of the future of uh, Google owned stories. <laughs> and we'll check in about genre then. Thank you so much for joining me guys. Um, uh, this was just fantastic. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Thanks guys. <laughs>